right, I'm going to go ahead uh, and get started. So my name, uh, as I've said, I'm, I'm John Copans, uh, work for the Council on Rural Development. Uh, I think most of you heard the introduction from Paul and Joshua Hanford in the opening session. But just uh, to reiterate, this uh, recovery visit is really uh, sponsored by the governor's local support and community action team. Uh, and uh, we at VCRD are sort of just the facilitators of this conversation. Uh, and really what this is, is a listening session. It's also an opportunity for you to connect with each other and, and hear from each other about what you're experiencing and to be brainstorming together about how we respond. Uh, I think it goes without saying we are in a time without real precedent. You know, I'm, I'm in my mid 40s and this certainly uh, compares to no other time that, uh, that I've, I've lived through. And uh, we in Vermont are, I would say blessed with communities that are cohesive, where we have a, uh, an inclination to look after one another and the opportunity to do that. We have sort of the structure of our communities often gives us that opportunity and I think to some degree, as we think about the topic for tonight's uh, breakout session around community and isolation and, and how we think about that, uh, I think thinking about sort of Orange County and, and what you have as, um, as assets and, and challenges in that area is, is what this conversation is about. Uh, before we do that, uh, as Paul mentioned in the opening session, we do have a couple of um, visiting team members, and we're gonna hear from one of those visiting team members. We'll, we'll call him a keynote speaker up top, but I wanna be sure and just recognize those visiting team members uh, who are on this. We've got uh, Beth Awady. Beth, you wanna just sort of, I guess, wave to folks. And then we've also got Steve Costello on as well. And then I also want to acknowledge Sarah Rate, who is here. She is our scribe for this evening. And so just know that we, um, Sarah's sole responsibility here is to be taking detailed notes on this conversation. That's a lot of how we're gathering feedback that we are going to share with the governor's task force. And so uh, while I'm facilitating, Sarah will be busy furiously typing away or writing away as she's, she's taking notes on this, on this conversation. So um, I am going to, uh, let me just quickly run through the agenda and then I'm gonna turn it over to Steve to say, say, say a few words. So uh, the, the structure of this conversation is that uh, we're gonna hear from Steve uh, and then we are going to talk a little bit about what do you all want for our community around this topic of building community unity and, and, and tackling isolation. Then we will talk about what is holding us back from achieving this. <clears throat> Are there promising practices, strategies, or programs uh, in, in the town or region that are being deployed to tackle this? And what are your ideas for additional action that are still needed at the state level to address these challenges? I would say at the state and uh, local and regional level, let's say all three in terms of addressing these challenges or working towards equitable economic recovery and renewal. And then finally, at the very end, we're gonna hear from the visiting team to share some reflections because they, their primary function here is to listen to you all and then they will share uh, some feedback um, and, and some, some reflections and ideas. So let me just pause there and just sort of look out at the group. I wanna be sure, you know, I know I can just get going here does anyone have any questions for me before we get started? All right, seeing none, I am gonna call to the, the proverbial microphone, uh, the irrepressible Steve Costello from, from over in Rutland, who's gonna share some perspective. And Steve, maybe if you could introduce yourself a little bit to folks too, that'd be great. Sure, so for starters, you may be having a little deja vu. My brother is Paul, and I know exactly what I will look like seven years from now because uh, I've looked exactly like him my entire life, and my family calls me Little Paul. Anyway, um, thanks for having me, John. It's great to see you again, and uh, welcome to everybody from Orange County. I'm excited to be able to help hopefully a little bit today. Um, 
Just for a background, um, I'm a vice president at Green Mountain Power, focused on customer care and community development, primarily in Rutland County. And uh, in that role, have been involved in a lot of different projects and, and programs over the last several years, um, all aimed at trying to do kind of exactly what this discussion tonight is all about, to bring people together and to try to create a better future for the community at large. And in this case, we're talking all of Rutland County. Um, I'll, I guess I'll start with something that's really related to COVID-19 and that has had a huge impact at, um, helping bring people together. Um, and that is a, a campaign that uh, myself and a couple others started a few years back and it's called I Love Rutland. Sounds very simple. Um, we basically decided we were gonna start trumpeting the positive things that are happening in Rutland County. And if you know anything about Rutland County and Rutland City, um, over the last 10 years, it's taken its lumps. Um, you know, like a lot of rural parts of Vermont, it doesn't have the economic drivers that say Chittenden County has. And we've had to work hard for everything that, that we've gotten positive in Rutland County over the years, especially in the last 10 years or so. Um, but a small group of us started this thing called I Love Rutland. It quickly blossomed into something that others wanted to be part of. And uh, it's not just all, hey, everything's great. We, you know, we try to focus on what some of our challenges are. Uh, we help try to bring people together in a positive way. And I'll talk about the COVID one as a perfect example. So when COVID-19 hit, uh, we really quickly realized um, in this tiny little group that there was going to be a lot of challenges, getting people to wash hands, getting people to social distance, all the things that we now know that play such a key role. And it was very clear to us that that was gonna be a challenge not only in Rutland, but in Vermont and across the country. And we thought of a cool way to try to bring people together over that topic. And so we reached out to a local business person, asked him if he'd be willing to give us some money. And we went from an idea to announcing um, a sign campaign and it sounds so simple and almost goofy but we produced a thousand yard lawn signs like you might see in a political campaign that said very simply um, we had seven or eight different themes wash your hands use you know wipe surfaces stay six cows or six feet or stay one cow apart if you've heard that it started in Rutland um, all kinds of little sayings like that thanks to frontline workers etc and every sign had um, that at the top, some you know, special message at the top, the governor's stay home, stay safe message behind that, and then the I Love Rutland logo behind it. And we thought at first, you know, this would be a kind of cool way to hopefully draw down, you know, keep the COVID uh, instances um, low in Rutland County and maybe bring some people together. We had no idea. Um, we made the signs available in one day, in literally like one hour, all 1,000 signs were gone. So within a week, we ordered another thousand. They were gone in two hours. Um, a week later, we had another thousand and those were all gone in two or three hours. And it wasn't about the signs after a little while. It was about being part of something, being part of a group who was trying to do something positive. So my, my big takeaway, if there's anything here today that I can offer, it is don't be afraid of um, asking for permission to do something. Don't ask, uh, you know, don't be afraid of all the, what are the challenges gonna be? Just put the stake in the ground, decide you're gonna do something and do it. Um, I'll touch on one other topic that we've really used in Rutland County that I think has been enormously helpful in addressing the exact topic of, of tonight's, um, of, this, of this subgroup. And that is using the art, uh, using art and the arts as something to bring people together in a really public, simple way. So over the last uh, six or seven years, um, a, a partner of mine, Mark Foley, has been um, commissioning murals around Rutland. And I think there are almost 20 now. And they, they vary from a simple painting of whales on a wall to one of Batman smashing his way through a wall. So when you look at it from the outside, it literally looks like he's coming out of the wall and grabbing a griffin out of the air um, as he's doing it. It's, four stories high and it's really spectacular. Um, we just put up the, the most recent one um, of a young black girl staring out from the wall and a, and a sunflower in front of her and petals from the sunflower flying off in the breeze with words like cherish, love, uh, respect. 
very simple messaging, not driving it down anyone's throat, but a very simple messaging that virtually anyone is going to, you know, have a, a positive reaction to. Um, we have also started a, a, a sculpture campaign in Rutland over the last three years. And so far we've commissioned 10 marble sculptures. They're carved by professional sculptors right here in West Rutland um, at the Carving Studio and Sculpture Center. And they are being focused around our downtown, creating the Rutland Sculpture Trail, which she started out with one, quickly had two. By the end of this summer, we'll have about 10 and we're working on funding for two or three more. Um, again, it's a very small group that's doing that. There's no board of directors. There's no permission sought. We pretty much uh, held a press conference, announced we were starting the Rutland Sculpture Trail. We had money for the first one and no idea how we'd fund them after that. Um, and people have come out of the woodwork, again, to be part of something bigger than themselves. Um, we thought fundraising would be very, very difficult and it's been remarkably easy. Once we showed the quality of what we were trying to do and the experience that we were trying to create for the community, um, people have been incredibly generous. And in fact, just a week or so ago, I had a gentleman call me and ask about a sculpture trail and what it would entail to do a sculpture of a certain person who was very well known in Rutland County, but probably not up there. Um, and we talked and 10 minutes later, he was writing a check for $40,000 to fund a sculpture. Um, I think I'll stop there, John, and leave it uh, with this final message. Don't be afraid to take on something way bigger than you think that you can handle. Get a group of people together. It doesn't have to be 100. It can be two or three and start with something. Just put that stake in the ground out there of what you want to accomplish, and you will be amazed if your energy and positivity is there, how you will draw people to do what you are hoping to do yourself. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Steve. Yeah. Uh, most definitely uh, inspirational. And I have to say, uh, VPR did a great uh, story today about the new mural. I shared a link to that. And uh, just listening to people's reaction the first time they're looking at that mural and, and literally breaking down in tears as they sort of appreciate the power of it. That was a quite a, quite a VPR story. Uh, yeah, it was. I actually got teary-eyed reading it this morning, John. <laughs> That's really something else. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. All right. So now, uh, now it's time to turn it over to you all. And, um, and as I said, we're going to start this conversation with this question of what do you or we want for our community in this area of building community unity and, uh, and tackling isolation. And as, as I sort of turn this over to you, I, you know, there's, there's three words we've been using as we think about these conversations, uh, response, recovery, and renewal. And I think it's helpful as we think, as we have this conversation to think about all of those. For, for a while now, we've been in response mode. People have immediate needs and urgent needs and cascading needs that we need to be responsive to. Uh, but then, there is a shifting, and it's a, it's a shifting that happens for different people at different times towards recovery and then ultimately thinking towards renewal. And how do we make our communities and our state even stronger than it was before we uh, entered into the pandemic? So just, uh, just be thinking about all of that, I think, as you think about where, um, where do you want your community to go uh, and uh, what do you want for your community in this arena? So I will pause there and look for some hands or I see um, somebody typing into chat. How are people living with addiction uh, being met with services to address isolation uh, during the pandemic? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And, and let me just say, that'll prompt me to say, you know, in addition to taking notes on what you share with us, uh, uh, please feel free to type things into chat. We will capture everything that's typed into chat as well. I'll do my best to read the chat as we go, um, but um, also just know we're recording that as well. I see uh, Kristen's got a hand up. Go ahead, uh, Kristen. Yeah, hi, I'm Kristen Briggs with Claire Martin Center. Um, so as many of you may be aware, we serve Orange County and then uh, the top of a county below us as well. And so I had seen the question come up uh, from Christiane, if I'm saying that correct, uh, about the living with addiction being met with services. So I, um, 
one of the things as an agency that we have had to kind of adapt more so to during COVID is that while before we certainly rely on people being accepting of our services, right? So either reaching out on their own in some way to get services from us or referrals um, from different PCP offices or, or other sources, uh, residential level of care treatment, things like that. Um, during COVID really it has been a lot of individuals having to reach out for support because they're not otherwise going to these other services maybe they were in the past. So it has definitely created barriers for treatment for things like substance use because if people are staying home and there aren't, um, for both mental health and substance use, I should say, but if people are having kind of what I would refer to as quiet crises, so uh, there aren't as many people around them noticing the struggle that they're going through um, or uh, it's somehow otherwise kept more under wraps during times like this. So other people aren't reaching out to our agency out of concern um, for folks as much as they would have if they were spending time more in the community. Uh, and, and also there's not other entities kind of involved with treatment to the same degree that there would be normally, like somebody going to even their PCP or something um, as simple as that. So, um, we have done a lot of outreach to community partners to make sure that we are letting people know that we are here and and operating and that we are accepting referrals, that we are seeing clients, we're taking on new clients, doing intakes, continuing treatment with existing clients. We're doing a hybrid model of some in-person services for people who are really in need of that level, um, taking precautions um, with COVID. And we are also doing phone sessions with anybody who's willing to do that and um, Zoom, Zoom sessions. So. Uh, we try to get the messaging out there for those things being available using our um, Facebook page for Clara Martin Center and for Central Vermont Substance Abuse Services, um, which is CVSAS in Berlin, and uh, and then also on our just our regular websites, um, and of course you know um, services that aren't mandated, um, folks need to be willing to engage in that, but we're really trying to continue working with folks, even if there's not um, care that's, that's even if there's not a successful connection, we're really trying to stay connected and keep encouraging people to keep connecting with us. Um, but I would say that um, some of the other barriers have been just connectivity. So people who maybe operate on phone minutes, you know, trying to figure out how to support getting people those minutes through some of the resources we've been able to get as an agency. Um, internet access is a struggle, as we all know, but it, it definitely has been a struggle and it's us trying to learn different ways to and adapt to different ways of reaching out and continuing to reach out that maybe looked a little different before COVID. Okay. Or a Thanks, lot different. Kristen. Yeah. Uh, Alice. Hi, thanks. Um, you know, I think Kristen's description of, of the, um, the ability of organizations to reach out and, and work with folks is the same kind of thing that we're hearing in other parts of or Southern, in Windsor County and across the river in New Hampshire as well. Um, I think that there are some opportunities at this time that with, with a caveat, um, I have heard from some places that there are people, just like there are students that have thrived in the remote learning world, believe it or not, there are people who are thriving in the telehealth world, particularly when it comes to addiction treatment and mental health services. And you know, the, the anxiety of leaving the home, the, um, the, the feeling of, of stigma, which we hope eventually to work through with people, but sometimes being able to do those services from their home has actually made their, their journey a little easier. And, and so when, and this is the caveat, when good um, connectivity is available for people, and I know from the work that I've done over the last few months that many of the Vermont communities, smaller towns, um, still don't have great internet access. Although I will say many of our New Hampshire towns are even worse. Um, you know, if they don't have that connectivity, then they are more isolated. But when they do, 
um, in addition to the telehealth options that a number of our community mental health and treatment providers have really worked hard to put together quickly, uh, I also have seen a lot of activity around recovery groups available online. It's not the same as getting together in a room with people who are sharing your journey, but um, it's better than nothing. And again, I think there are some people for whom this approach actually is helping them. Uh, so I'm hoping that as we move forward and get back to being able to see people in person, that we don't let this telehealth option for folks go away. And we do double down on the um, issue around uh, broadband or, or internet access for folks. Great. Those are great points. Absolutely. Other, uh, as folks think uh, about this question of community unity and what do you want, Ashleen, go for it. Or with, are you just raising your hand in support or to speak? I'm not sure. I think that's actually like a clapping symbol, but <laughs> we're going to go with it because um, I do have a comment. So, um, just kind of along these lines of telehealth and, and communication. Um, so my name is Ashleen Buchanan. I'm the program and grants coordinator at Little Rivers Healthcare. We're a uh, healthcare facility in Bradford, Wells River and East Corinth. Um, one thing that we're working on right now in that we actually have been planning to do before, but now it seems even more relevant during COVID and this. Um, so we're working with teens but we're also partnering with local organizations. We partner with um, Clara Martin Center, the local libraries, and the mentoring project, the Upper Valley Mentoring Project, and the Teen Hub, which is a new teen center. They just opened up. Their timing was like right on COVID, but they actually have opened their doors, and it's a new teen center in Bradford. And one thing that we've really... so about a year ago, I was going through the um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a annual survey that students take in the Oxbow, uh, yeah, the Oxbow Supervisory Union, no, East Orange Supervisory Union. Um, and one thing that we noticed for the teens in our area was they're statistically significantly higher in a lot of categories, but one in particular is that they don't feel that they matter to people in their community. And when we noticed that statistically high, like being statistically higher in that category, that just leaves teens at risk for a lot of, a lot of different issues, whether it's substance abuse or depression, mental health is issues, you know, it, the kind of the list then goes from there. And we felt like that was really a root of a lot of issues that are coming up. And now with COVID and even greater disconnection to friends at school or safe, uh, you know, safety has been an issue. Um, and also just an adult figure who they may have connected with in schools or in other exterior um, extracurricular activities or whatever. So what we suggested was we, we did a, on a virtual teen speak out where teens from the, our entire region could come together and just talk to each other about what was going on this originally came out with, I think, I'm not sure if it was Clara Martin Center talking with our group or, or maybe the libraries, but um, a couple of leaders were, were saying, you know, they wanted to make sure teens had access to all these resources that they felt that they had to give. And um, what, what I brought forward was maybe we don't want to offer resources right now. We just want to like listen and we want to give teens an opportunity to say what resources they actually want because our idea of a resource might not be beneficial to them. So anyways, they came together. It was a tiny group to start, but we're hoping we're going to try to kick it off again. Um, but we, what was great about it being virtual was actually we had teens from all over. When we were going to do it in person, it was only going to be Oxbow, but we ended up having teens from, um, some teens came from Bethel, and, uh, but also Fairley and Oxbow. And Thetford Academy, which Thetford Academy is not actually part of the OESU, but it doesn't matter. Anyways, and the other part that was cool was some of the teens were clients at Clara Martin Center, and some of the teens were just had just heard about the student uh, this program from school, 
And what was cool about that is often in these teen groups, uh, there's not like a good mixture of teens from all different sorts of backgrounds or, you know, whatever. And this was an opportunity where they all just kind of like showed up to this virtual space. And we're like, oh, you're here. Like now we get to hear your take on life and like how it's been. And one of the big things was some of the teens had cars, some of the teens didn't. And that was a huge impact on them during COVID-19 and, and whatnot. So anyways, going all the way back around to Steve Sello, who was talking about the artwork in Rutland, which is really cool. And thank you to whoever put that link. Um, they have decided that they want to do a project for the community in light of COVID-19. And those teens are working towards creating a mural, a, a community mural. Um, but what we really want to see is, and what our ultimate goal is, how to continue to engage teens in our community. I think that is something that, especially in rural Vermont, we are losing population. Um, we want teens to be heard. We want them to feel like they definitely matter. But what does that look like and how is that actually implemented and engaging for teens? So that's kind of, I wanted to bring that to this group and hopefully hear what you guys think because I don't, I'm definitely open to hearing. So that's it. That's great. Thank you, Ashleen. Uh, I'm uh, speaking of teens, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm about to be accosted by some near teens. So pardon me if there's any interruptions in the background here as uh, as we all juggle our, our family and work life. So um, I, our next prompt for this, uh, we're, we're on to the next one here. And, and that is around sort of what are the barriers that are holding us, uh, holding us back from achieving some, some of these things. And I guess what I'll do is say to you some that I've already heard you articulate. Um, you know, connectivity, clearly a persistent, uh, uh, persistent across all of this conversation, right? If a teenager didn't have connectivity, how would they participate? with telehealth or recovery groups, right? Connectivity is a big one. And then uh, Kristen, I heard you talk about sort of that, the, the sort of cross referral, uh, like when someone walks in somewhere for some services, often there is some connectivity, sort of connections that happen. And some of that, because that some of that in-person work isn't, isn't happening in the same way, that's, that's perhaps a barrier. What are some other barriers uh, that are holding uh, holding Orange County uh, back in terms of this community unity. Yeah, I, this one just came to mind with something Ashleen was saying and what with what you just uh, brought back from earlier. So I was thinking um, there's kind of shifting barriers. This speaks to what Alice was saying as well. You know, before we had a barrier that was um, transportation. So people either had a car but couldn't get it running or didn't have the gas to get to and from treatment. Um, needed to be set up with Medicaid rides if they had Medicaid, whatever the situation is. And now transportation for a lot of people might not be the barrier as long as they have the connectivity, but if they don't have either um, and also run off of minutes or something like that, like they're really, they're, they have all the barriers right now. They don't have the transportation or the connectivity needed. Um, and so how do we create, you know, a barrier to the way of doing things pre-COVID is that we had such specific ways of connecting people to resources, uh, you know, like phone cards or gas cards or um, things like that, but never really um, something that was maybe a monthly subscription to an internet provider or um, things that maybe could be an area of focus um, sustainably moving forward if this um, legislative movement to get telehealth to stay um, is successful, which it sounds like um, a lot of us are hoping is the case. Um, and uh, the other thing that I was going to say, as I say this very slowly, so I try to remember it, because <laughs> it just came out of my brain. Um, uh, shoot. Kristen, we can, uh, we can definitely loop back with you. Yes, I'll have to loop back. I lost it, sorry. You know, one, I'll state an obvious one. I, I had the opportunity uh, to go down to Winterfest at Fars Hill this winter. And like, as I think about sort of community unity and tackling isolation, 
I think about, one of the things I think about is events and just like, you know, here in Montpelier, there's those gatherings where you just know you're going to see people and that makes you feel like you're, you're part of a community, even school drop off, right? Those routines, even going to the grocery store. And so I don't know if others have reflections about sort of that, the, the nature, obviously we're not gathering in big groups. We're not, the, a lot of those events have fallen by the wayside. We're not dropping kids off at school. So I don't know, are there, when we think about some of the barriers, maybe I'm just stating the, the, the obvious one, but are there, there are other things that people think about as we think about the nature of this crisis? So one of the things that I've been doing over the last few months for um, my own organization as, well, as part of Upper Valley Strong, which I noticed many of the people on this call live in towns that are covered by Upper Valley Strong, um, we've been reaching out, a team of us, to nearly every town in the region to talk to somebody, whether it's somebody within municipal government or somebody who's a part of a mutual aid group, to find out what's going on. And, and one of the, the reasons is to figure out what we through Upper Valley Strong can do to support them. But the other is just to gather a lot of information about what positive things are happening, how are communities meeting the needs of their residents. Um, and, and so I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but I don't want to spend my time on that one. But one of the things that that I've been amazed by is the number of towns who can identify that they had a groundswell of folks step up to volunteer, doing everything from grocery shopping for folks, um, feeding chickens, uh, doing almost anything that needed to get done. I do think that now that is, they're starting to lose a lot of those volunteers. Um, but some communities created neighborhood captain programs where they divided their community up into sectors and then they found somebody who would be like the lead person for that area. And it's more challenging in more rural communities, clearly. Um, but what I'm finding now is that communities who didn't do that are asking me about it. Like, oh, I hear that so-and-so did this. So as we move forward and, and we facilitate some groups, particularly folks working on um, supporting older adults in their communities, we're thinking about how can we learn more about how these kinds of organizations, this, this informal structure, like a phone tree or something in a community is, is um, structured, and share that information with the towns in our region so that others can think about setting it up ahead of time um, and creating a structure for that. And I, so I think that there are lots of opportunities and we're gonna be learning from all of the towns that we're communicating with about the barriers, obviously, that they're facing, but also the, the wonderful things that they're learning about themselves that they wanna make sure they can preserve going forward. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's uh, an excellent reflection. Michael. I'm Michael Saka from Tunbridge. Um, one one thing that you know we we reacted um, immediately, and there was a lot of online um, communications, and still are obviously this. But it seems like people that I know in my circles and all have pulled back some from some of that involvement, and it and it's and it's looking like um, here in Tunbridge on our road we organized kind of a very local. Um, support group, I guess, um, which everybody on the our road, which is probably 25 houses or so, maybe 20, um, is in touch with each other. And, you know, even if there's not a lot of, um, um, you know, sometimes people are picking up things for others, but even that, you know, people, the contact is not um, really desirable. But just knowing um, that that we're in touch with each other with email change and also telephone, um, I think has helped. And and uh, and that that size neighborhood or road sized organization um, may be one way to both stay in touch and also have one's own space. I guess. Uh, so that's that's one sort of observation and maybe suggestion. Um, and and I'm. Um, I, I, I'm the president of an organization called the Alliance for Vermont Communities um, in this area. And we've really had a challenge in staying engaged because we like to get together, of course, everyone does, and meet face to face. And um, 
and that's been a challenge again because you know the 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 zoom meetings only go so far um and they're good and they're valuable but still you know we're, we're not going to have that that person-to-person -person contact which really is important um for spontaneous discussion really discussion on zoom is not the same <laughs> um and you know we're we're looking in our region too about food systems um and what's coming next how we can uh ricochet off of what's going on here um and and, and try to create and really build the local food systems um and that that and gardening obviously has taken off and that's a way to also stay engaged with people by offering workshops and that kind of thing the last thing I want to say, and this may or may not fit into this category, but um, I'm starting to think about what's going to happen when the weather changes in, say, October. Um, right now, we have the luxury of being outside and meeting um, socially that way, but that will probably end at some point in the next couple of months. And um, and of course, everything's unknown, but, um, but I'm, I'm wondering how how we're going to adapt yet again um, to, to needing to be inside and probably really isolated. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. I, uh, I see Catherine Kidder's hand and then Steve Costello. So Catherine, go for it. Um, we had a situation in Newberry. In West Newberry, we happened to have a directory from the church that listed everybody in town. So when this started, we had a list already of to go to. And we had volunteers. I mean, within a week we were set up and we were calling every single person in West Newberry once a week to check on them because we had that list. We also had a little organization that was taking care of um, people who are in need, maybe temporarily. And um, it was all very private. So we had, even though we didn't know who they were, we had the vulnerable people in town identified. Um, and it worked really well. Then Newberry was, was behind us. Okay, but we found it's not with really spicy. It's just oh, kind of hang on. Let me. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Go for okay. it, Catherine. Keep going. But without that contact list, we weren't able to take it to the degree that we did in West Newberry. So we had people calling. You know, I called maybe ten people every week, and we developed a relationship with them, and were able to meet their needs in a, in a way that was different than if, you know, just saying, what can I do to help? You know, they were coming to us with things that they needed and it worked really well. So, you know, we have a small community. We don't even know where West Newberry ends. And I think that was part of our problem is that we're not, a, <laughs> geographical areas are, are very fuzzy with these towns uh, with different parts to them. But being small and being so connected that way, it really has helped. And I think it's all calmed down now. But if, you know, in the wintertime, um, we'll be back back at it, calling each other and keeping track of people. But it started with that list. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, as often happens in this meetings, you all have naturally transitioned to the next agenda item, which is, are there promising practices, strategies, or programs that have been sort of deployed in the, in the town and in the region? And, and we're hearing some great ones here. This is great. Steve, uh, you, you had a hand up. Sure, I just wanted to highlight a, a comment I posted on the thing. Um, several of you have talked about one way or another, the digital world and um, you know, little groups, Facebook groups or what have you. Um, I can't strongly enough, as much as Facebook drives me nuts with what it um, allows and doesn't allow on, on posts and the like, um, you can create a real community very quickly through Facebook or uh, Front Porch Forum and really connect people, whether it's a street, as one gentleman was talking about, or a much broader uh, community. And um, I posted an example, um, which is kind of um, almost mind boggling. There's a few groups in Rutland. There's a I Love Rutland Facebook group, and there's a Rutland Positive Spotlight page um, to somebody's point about just positivity. Um, those two pages both have a, a no, criticism rule and if anyone violates that rule or starts getting negative they immediately get warned and if they do it again they're gone and those both of those groups have several thousand people in them 
I think the uh, uh, Rutland Positive Spotlight page is only a couple years old and it's up to about 5,000. But the link that I shared um, and that John will share later with the whole group um, started as a Facebook page called Rut Rutland Lights Up the World. And it literally was at the beginning of the COVID thing when people were a little depressed and it was still winter and everyone was being told to stay home. And people simply were posting pictures of lights. Some people were putting up their Christmas lights again. Some people started putting up stars. And before you knew it, over 20,000 people had joined that group and it had to get renamed Help Vermont Light Up the World. And today there are over 25,000 members of that group with no advertising, just totally a, a you know, group by itself. Not that anyone in, in a small town in Orange County wants 25,000 people to deal with on a regular basis, but it just shows you how quickly you can build real sense of community if you manage it well, and uh, it can be very helpful. I also wanna offer, um, I think it's Ashleen, um, if John, um, you can go on the GMP Facebook page or I'm sorry, the Green Mountain Power website and find my email address or John maybe can share it with folks later. Um, I got some some ideas for you on the uh, on the mural thing that you could take that a lot further with the kids if, if you're interested. Great, thanks Steve. Mike, I see a hand up. Yeah, thanks John. Um, you know, at the beginning of this, you had mentioned the, um, you know, talking about response recovery and renewal and, and just the response of being that ad addressing immediate needs. And uh, there's just, I think a tremendous uh, showing of support and, and community as we went into this whole pandemic shutdown process. Uh, you know, at Stagecoach, we, we uh, suspended a number of our routes because of them serving uh, senior populations that uh, that primarily served, uh, uh, you know, senior center programs. Uh, so as those programs closed down, those routes really weren't needed. Uh, as a result, we had a lot of drivers with spare time, uh, you know, that we wanted to keep everyone employed and working and, uh, you know, really offered our services out to, you know, and, and we were granted flexibility by, by uh, Agency of Transportation. So we're looking for ways to deliver deliver meals. You know, could we get involved with meals on wheels programs or help out, uh, you know, with people deliveries from grocery stores, whatever was needed. And uh, time after time, as we're reaching out to these groups, and someone else had mentioned as well, there's such huge outpouring of volunteer support that uh, that in in many cases those additional services weren't really needed. Uh, you know, we've since been able to to you know work with a couple of food shelves and um, and school uh, school meal programs. So we have been able to fill some of that. But just that idea of the community coming together, identifying needs and responding, whether that's an, on an organizational level or just individuals looking to help, uh, I think you know really shows strength in the community. And you know, as we look forward, we know. Uh, you know, there's there's certainly going to be continued concerns around um, COVID-19 and and health concerns. I uh, you know we also imagine that economic impacts are going to be here for for a long time to come, and um, we hope that that community spirit and that that uh, willingness to help out other people continues as we as we get through this and and come out the other side. Yeah, I think that's a, an important question of how do we sustain that spirit and keep keep those people who step forward to volunteer? How do you keep them sort of engaged and um, so that they uh, so that they they stay involved in in the important work? Uh, we have a few more minutes to just uh, hear from you all about what are some promising practices or strategies or programs that you've you've seen uh, in in this arena and and I would say. Don't limit yourself. It doesn't have to be something you were involved with. It doesn't even have to be something you saw in the town or region. Maybe it's just something you've observed somewhere that you were, you thought, huh, that was a creative response. You know, I happen to be, because of the work I do, I was on a neighborhood email list for a little neighborhood in Middlebury, Vermont. And like, they did that thing where you put teddy bears in the window for little kids to walk around and look at just as a fun thing to get kids motivated. And not only did they, like basically the whole neighborhood seemed to have some kind of stuffed animal in the window, but then somebody was so motivated that they even created uh, a map 
for the parents so that they knew where everything was, you know? So like just those kinds of uh, at, sort of people just rallying together to do even goofy things that, um, that just put a smile on, on neighbors' faces, I think, so. Other, other things that you all have, have observed or participated in? The birthday parades, there's a, there's a good one, yep. And some graduation, you know, I, I don't know if folks have any high school graduates or middle school graduates, any reflections there, but I've seen a lot of uh, different approaches to, to making that a, a moment of unity. So um, seeing none, maybe we'll move on to, uh, to this final prompt before we turn it back over to our, our visiting team for some reflections. But uh, are there, what ideas do you have for additional action uh, whether that's at, at your town level, uh, the regional level, or the state level, uh, to really uh, address the challenges that the community is facing uh, and the state is facing, and 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 how do we how do we shift towards recovery and renewal? And I'll just share back a few that I've already heard from you all. You know this that uh, narrative around Newberry and West Newberry, and just that advantage of having a pre-existing list. Uh, for West Newberry. So how do we think about like those lists and, and how, you know, I know a lot of different commu community organizations have been sort of grappling with that question of like, well, if we want to proactively outreach to our neighbors, what, what do we do? Uh, how do we, how do we, where do we even start with that work? And, uh, an, you know, another idea uh, or practice is that working at the neighborhood scale, really thinking about sort of the people you know on your street uh, and, and, and how, are you, um, how are you in touch with them and, and building that sense of community where people know, know that they're taken care of. Other ideas from you all. Census, actually they're not. Census, uh, <laughs> I can answer that question, right? Census is only shares a certain aggregate level of data, right? That's, by definition, when they get you to answer those questions, they commit to a certain certain level of privacy there. So, Ashleen, did I see a hand? Um, yeah, I, I don't want to, um, I hope that this is still on topic, but when you're talking about the lists in Newberry, uh, one thing that I've heard a lot about is um, connecting people to resources. And one of the things that was a little bit surprising was in our region, the, um, the free food that was becoming available hasn't been as highly utilized as we thought it would be considering the need that we assumed. Um, and I, I think that, that we actually had data showing the amount of families who were potentially food insecure uh, and individuals. And um, so we there were a lot of food drops and um, food availability now and before, but it hasn't been as as sought after as we thought. So one of the things that I've been connected with with a couple of different groups in East Grant and Tunbridge and here and um, Upper Valley Strong and things like that is everyone says, oh, we, we need a resource. We need to make sure that everyone knows where the things are and everything. Um, and my concern is not so much a concern. I think absolutely there needs to be a resource. People need to know where um, things are. But the my concern is that we've created too many resources. And I wonder if people just at this point aren't quite sure where to look. Like every organization has a resource guide and they're not always up to date and they're not always um, complete. And so that's one thing in a team that I run out of Little Rivers called the Upper Valley Unified Community Collaborative. We worked on making a, a, a resource guide, but again, the same problems potentially came up. So that was something I'm not sure is like, do we need more resources or do we need to make a resource that's truly efficient and, and people know about that one resource? Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, it does, yes, it gets very chaotic, especially in Vermont where we have town level organization, we have regions, but they're not consistent regions, right? You look at school districts, you look at all, all sorts of overlaps and it can be really hard for an individual to sort of navigate that chaos and figure out uh, what they need. Kristen, I see you've got a hand up. 
Yeah, I was just going to further that the COVID has allowed this to, uh, this was already an issue, I think, Ashley, and you might have been pointing out, and we would probably all agree, but with COVID, it was, it's like become a huge focus uh, because a lot of resources started up that weren't already in existence, adding to that spread out of resources. And so the Working Communities Challenge, which I know that we have representation in all of these different four breakouts tonight, um, I'm here from Claire Martin Center, but also happen to be part of that group. So um, it's not representative of all of Orange County. It's, it pulls from other counties as well, but that's something that we've talked about in trying to get engagement for that group you know, the people that we were, the entities or places that we were reaching out to before COVID to try and get involvement. And then once COVID hit, you know, not even knowing all of these kind of mutual aid groups that have come up and what are we, I don't want to say wasting time, but maybe what are different groups spending a lot of energy or focus on that is happening elsewhere where we're separately creating all of these different wheels. And, and so it's, it's, confusing for people to not know where to look or not know what resource might apply to them and not others who might be close neighbors, you know, but just happen to be a different town line. But also, how much energy are we using creating wheels separate from each other versus having maybe more things like this that are involving larger groups of people and idea sharing um, where, where some of those um, things could happen. 211, I agree, is, is a great place to start um, and is catching up to a lot of the resources that have been identified, but it, it is pointing out um, separate, also separate resources. So it's just, yeah, it's good that there's a lot happening, though, as I would say as well. You know, yeah, one of the a, things, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Alice. I was going to say, one of the things that I have found is the value of the connections. So the phone calls that I make when I'm talking to people in the towns you know, it's so so there's getting resource lists, so to speak, to the to the residents who need to use those. Um, but sometimes it's making sure that the referral networks like you guys, like Ashleen and Kristen and others know what's out there or know where to go to find out what makes sense. And so I think that being able to make these connections, there are there are now people in a number of towns who say, Huh, if I if I'm stymied here, if I don't know what to do, let me just send email Alice an email real quick and see if she can help me sort through this. And and so having those connections with somebody where you feel like it's not just looking on the web to find something, it's going some to a person who can help you work that out. I think that 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 is definitely something we need to do more of. You know, resource lists are time sensitive things and um and, and so making sure we know what's going on and how things are changing and are communicating, I think is helpful. I, I will say, Ashleen, that there are other parts of our region where the food is just being taken up by a lot of people. So it really depends community to community. Um, there was something else I was gonna say, but I can't think of it right now. Just raise your hand again, don't be shy. Others, um... Others have some reflections or ideas. You know, I saw, you know, as you mentioned in the chat, 211, which is a great resource, but then Christiane's question about how to get connected with mutual aid groups. And one of the interesting challenges, just like Michael was describing on his road, is, you know, our best level of organization is the local one, like we've talked about in a lot of instances. But uh, in, in many ways, those really local levels of organization are not obvious out to the outward community of other resource providers, right? They're not mapped. They're not on some resource list. They're just kind of um, much more or organic and local. And so there's almost like a translation uh, or connection challenge there between how do you take the bigger systems like 211 and bring it down to that local level? Steve Costello, go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect on something that seems like an overarching theme of, of this conversation, whether it's, uh, you know, on the addiction front or with Ashley and the high school kids or Michael on his, his road um, and many others, Alice as well. Um, and that is, you know, I think and it sums up by, from what Ashley, Ashley said, that the kids felt that they didn't matter, that no one really thought they mattered. Um, that's what this is all about, whether it's on your road or in your community or the town or the county, 
people want to matter. They want to be along and be part of something. And I think if you think of it that way, as you start um, thinking further beyond today about what you can do in your community to build the sense of unity, how can you help others feel that they matter? And you know that's a huge philosophical question probably, but it also is a really practical one. And I'll just throw out one idea that until now I never thought of it as something we could use in Rutland with people who are already here, but we have a program in Rutland called the Rutland Red Carpet that is designed to help people who are thinking about coming here feel connected. And what we do is when we get some, you know, we have a marketing campaign to draw people to move here. And when we get somebody who's interested, we assign them what we call a concierge. And the concierge's responsibility is to treat that person like they would their best friend from college if they were thinking about moving here. Meaning introduce them to people, help them make job connections, help them figure out where's a good place to live for them, introduce them to the schools, et cetera. And it doesn't, it seems like that it's a lot of work. It really isn't. I've, I'm literally juggling three or four uh, families that I've been a concierge for right now. And one of the simplest things that we've done with some of those families when they've come for a visit is throw a little informal meet and greet. And that's hard right now, but you can do it. Um, literally, um, you know, in the past, we've invited 10 or 15 people to meet a couple or a family at, you know, the local brewery or at the park or wherever. And before they leave, they have a sense of community that they never could have gotten on their own. You could do the exact same thing with people who are feeling unconnected within your own communities. Yeah, not only to recruit people, but to, to retain and connect people. Absolutely. I, I like that. That's a, uh, you, you witnessed it, folks, and a new version of the red carpet program uh, right here. Other, uh, other ideas, we've got a, a little more time before I'm gonna turn it back over to the visiting team, but are there other ideas? Ashleen, go for it. Um, yeah, just to kind of connect with Alice and what Steve is talking about is that um, one thing we, one group we started working with was an organization called Willing Hands, which some, some folks might be aware of. They're down in Norwich, they're a um, food, uh, they're a gleaning program, but they make sure that any food left over from uh, local farmers and producers doesn't go to waste. And so they transport that food to local organizations. And um, so we have right now we have a drop off coming every it's 150 pounds of produce every Wednesday to one clinic in Bradford. But I, I just got a grant this morning. That I'm really excited about. We're gonna in we're gonna um, purchase refrigerators and freezers um, to address what Alice was talking about. Is that people, our communities around us, seem to be utilizing food, and so we had to regroup and ask ourselves as a community, why are we not seeing the utilization that we're like we know it's there and we see it around us, but we're not sure what are we missing. Is it transportation? Is it is it people not getting the resources or not knowing where it's coming from? So this is kind of a twofold piece is right now we're working on getting the infrastructure, which is the refrigerators and freezers in our more rural clinics, which it would be Wells River and East Corinth. And then what we're going to do is try to implement like a slingshot deal where willing hands will come up from Norwich and deliver food to our Bradford clinic. Um, and then we're looking for a volunteer team, which there is a volunteer team out of Bradford right now um, to start bringing that food up to our other clinic. And so we'll, we have, um, Willing Hands has more food to give right now. And as long as we have the capacity, then they can deliver that and then we can slingshot it around the state. And so we're hoping to do that. And one idea that kind of came out of this whole team thing, and this is another piece of it, is one thing that can help teens, well, what we're speculating, I feel like we need to have a much deeper conversation. But one thing we were just talking about as a team, as a team, uh, was teens maybe can work. Like not, not that we're saying all the teens need to work, but being engaged in a in an actual handoff. Where, yeah, right now with COVID, we can't do full one on one. But if a teen knows they're delivering food to another family or they're, you know, they're benefiting someone else's life, even though that sounds a little like, aren't we supposed to make the teams feel like they matter? 
that might actually make them feel like they matter when they're really involved in a in someone's health and well-being. Great. Thanks, Ashley. And just uh, putting a little bit of another hat on, as you think about refrigerators and freezers, be sure to connect with Efficiency Vermont and maybe your local electric utility because they'll help you make sure you're getting the most efficient one. So. I actually will. I am just looking at purchasing options right now. So that's good to know. Definitely connect with them. And in fact, they've got some programs for uh, community nonprofits to help with those sorts of things too. Efficiency Vermont and what was the other one? Well, just I'm assuming you're Green Mountain Power. Steve, you would know. What, um, but yeah, so either or both, but I, I can connect with you uh, otherwise. I'll, I'll be sure to share, share my email address. So. I don't want to monopolize either, but Ashley just said something I think that's really um, a, a great example. Um, getting people together to do something good for something for someone else is a huge community driver. Um, Rutland, you can Google it. I won't bore you with all the details, but we've used blood drives to create enormous pride in our community and proud to say for six years, we've held the national record for the one day largest blood drive in American history. And we still have it. And I still have the tattoo on my shoulder to prove it. <laughs> but beyond the blood is a huge community builder. Yeah, and that really sort of loops back to this concept of mutual aid. And one of the things I observed with these mutual aid organizations is that they, their sign-up sheet really was about both. Do you have something to offer and do you need something? And, and they did that intentionally, right? Because we're often on both sides of that equation. And so it, it just reminds us that we're all in, this, uh, in, in, in these circumstances. Uh, together and, and that we may be on one side or the other. So, yeah, Alice. So I, I remembered um, my last thought. You know, one of the things that I think has been very valuable about this experience, if, if anything, is that more, many people who never thought that they would need help with anything needed help. Um, whether it was just asking a neighbor to go to the grocery store for them because it wasn't safe for them to do that, or whether for a variety of reasons, they actually did need some food from the food shelf, which they'd never done before. And I think that um, whereas poverty can sometimes hide in our communities and it's easy for people to think everybody is, is just like me, nobody has any needs. And, and then they chafe at the social service organizations that are telling them, no, we have problems with homelessness and we have problems with poverty and we have problems with with children who don't have enough food to eat. Um, this is a moment when I think uh, we may have a bump in empathy within our communities. Um, more people who are willing to say, boy, yeah, you know, there are times when, when any one of us might be a moment away from really needing to use the social safety nets that are available to us. And I, I think that this is an important opportunity to use that energy and to use that moment um, to help our communities understand the importance of these safety net systems for everybody in our communities. Other uh, reflections, other, other thoughts about how, uh, how your town or your region uh, is gonna sort of navigate its way out of this. I had a, just a thought, uh, just going back to what you had said about, or was said earlier about response, recovery and renewal and um, you know, just thinking sustainability um, really needs to be, like there are quick resources, somebody just mentioned this actually, maybe Alice, Qu quick resources that need to be made when something like this comes up, of course, um, and it needs to happen quickly and there might not be time to, you know, we might not be able to all communicate around that, but what we, can we learn in this, uh, John, I think you said first time in 40 something, years where something like this has happened, but what can we learn from this so that if something like this or something like Irene happens again, what sustainable systems do we have in place where maybe we are already working more as a cooperative it, within our different counties and um, valleys and all the nooks and crannies of Vermont, like what can we keep sustainable so that um, we already have a system of in place and, and respond that specific response can happen 
quicker, recovery potentially could happen quicker, but then continuing to strengthen that sustained system. That's a great, uh, a great prompt actually for folks. Uh, you know, if you think back and it's hard to, because it feels already like a long time ago, but if, if you think back to, you know, February and March when we were kind of, it was such a rapidly developing set of circumstances. And what, uh, if, if we could go back in time and put some of that sort of infrastructure in place so that we were more adept at the response, like what, what would that look like so that when we face the next crisis, uh, we're, we're more ready? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, does anyone have some, some thoughts? I mean, I think the lists is an example, sort of the connectivity, right, that you, you've talked about, the relationships and how important those are as we, as we find resources. Are there other things that people think about having in place uh, to be prepared? One thing that comes to my mind, just we struggled so much at the start of this with um, PPE supplies and uh, and get, you know, as so many did. And I think as we look kind of up the chain from our, from our individual communities, um, how we can get and and tremendous response from our communities. I mean, it's it's remarkable the way, you know, how many people are making cloth masks and distributing through Upper Valley Strong and and um, donating them to our organization and and you know people everywhere are making masks. But uh, but to really make sure that up the line at the at the state federal level that. Um, that hopefully we're all preparing for for the future and making sure that we have access to uh, to equipment that that might be needed in in emergencies as they come up. Uh, yeah, and that makes me think back to what Michael said about food systems, and and I know we we all are thinking about that. What do, what do we what do we have within our control within our sort of borders, whether that's our community. Or our state, um, so that um, we we can sort of control our own destiny and aren't aren't necessarily dependent on um, on a supply chain that we have absolutely uh, no control over, and tend to be at the the end of the the line, as 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 many say. I think also just going back to the point of how do we get young Vermonters to stay in Vermont, or how do we entice um, youth from outside of Vermont to come here because we can build sustainable systems, but once the people who care about those systems are uh, moving away from the direct work of them and we don't have kind of a new workforce for that, you know, those, those pieces that hold the smaller communities together will fall apart. And so I think a part of our sustainability as a state is figuring out how to keep youth here and get youth here. Yeah. And, uh, I'm just going to read it because I think it's a good point, for, you know, from Christiane's iPhone there. Uh, food cooperatives and CSA seem like potential natural community hubs. Uh, how, how can they be strengthened to provide more social outlet to communities and become central to communities and train young people to carry on the work? Yeah, that's, there's a good one.